suburb where we share together in this short service of readings and prayers and the reflection. We're going to commend our time to God by praying together. Let's all pray. Loving God, we thank you that we can take these few moments to pause, to share ourselves with you. We come at the end of the day, a day that has been busy, in many ways crowded, a day that we've enjoyed. All sorts of things have happened today, and we thank you for them. But now we thank you that we can come and be in your presence and that we can share with you that which is on our heart. We come acknowledging our own shortcomings, sinful people, as we would describe ourselves. We know the things we've said and done that have been wrong. We need you to forgive us, to remind us that you are a forgiving God to remind us that in love you would forgive even as we confess. Forgive us our sin. Reconcile us to yourself. Grant us to know that whatever, still we are accounted as your children and you are our Heavenly Father. To that end, bless this time that we share one with another now and do it for the sake of Jesus. Amen. We've all been shocked by events of recent days. The murder of the MP, David Amos. We're sorry for what has happened. We can't believe it. Writing in the first letter to Timothy, Paul reminds us that we are to pray for those who are in positions of authority. But in the letter to the Romans in chapter 13, he sets out the Christian's attitude to the political structure, how we should involve ourselves within the body politic, what should our approach be as Christians to the affairs of wider society. This Sunday seems as good a Sunday as any for us to be reminded of what Paul wrote. The letter to the Romans, chapter 13. Every person must submit to the authorities in power, for all authority comes from God, and the existing authorities are instituted by him. It follows that anyone who rebels against authority is resisting a divine institution, and those who resist have themselves to thank for the punishment they will receive. Governments hold no terrors for the law-abiding, but only for the criminal. You wish to have no fear of the authorities? Then continue to do right, and you will have their approval, for they are God's agents working for your good. But if you are doing wrong, then you will cause to fear them. It is not for nothing that they hold the power of the sword, for they are God's agents of punishment, bringing retribution on the offender. That is why you are obliged to submit. It is an obligation imposed not merely by fear of retribution, but by conscience. That is also why you pay taxes. The authorities are in God's service, as it is to this, they devote their energies. Discharge your obligations to everyone. Pay tax and levy, reverence and respect to those to whom they are due. Leave no debt outstanding, but remember the debt of love you owe one another. He who loves his neighbor has met every requirement of the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment there may be are all summed up in the one rule, love your neighbour as yourself. 
Love cannot wrong a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Always remember that this is the hour of crisis. It is high time for you to wake out of sleep, for deliverance is near to us now than it was when first we believed. It is far on in the night. Day is near. Let us therefore throw off the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave with decency, as befits the day. No drunken orgies, no debauchery or vice, no quarrels or jealousies. Let Christ Jesus himself be the armour that you wear. Give you unspiritual nature no opportunity in satisfying its desires. And we thank God for that word, which, if we're honest, is not easy to hear. Written many years ago, at a different time, in a different place, we find ourselves questioning something of what Paul himself said. We do not find it easy to acknowledge that government is over us by appointment from God. And whilst we live in a fairly benign democracy, and there are those who find themselves living under cruel dictatorships, how is it that they can acknowledge that government is in place from God? We can't know the mind of Paul as it was when he wrote that letter. I'm beginning to wonder if it was this. Paul sensed that God would use earthly institution, governmental institutions, to see to it that his underlying will and purpose for the world came about. That a sufficiently stable society was created within which the kingdom of God could flourish. As that kingdom took hold, as the kingdom evidenced itself in the life of the church. So the church would work with government to shape wider society, that each would influence the other. Neither would go out of the way to be critical of each other, but that if and when the moment came, they would not be slow to draw attention to the fact that there were contradictions and yes over time we have seen how some governments have moved far away from their mandate which is to facilitate the flourishing of the kingdom of God by their choices and actions they have denied the opportunity for the kingdom to flourish they have suppressed it God's will will not be thwarted. And as surely as God places women and men in authority over us, so, as appropriate, he will remove that authority. So how should we react? At a pastoral level, we should acknowledge the service rendered by those who find themselves holding political office not the highest paid job in the world. Paid far less, even those who are paid the most, paid far less than many who work in business and industry, indeed in other spheres of public service. Those who serve at a local level, who give up time and energy, sometimes voluntarily, to see to it that their local communities are ordered aright. And we are bound to acknowledge that whatever our feelings might be about our political representatives, and I've never hidden where my vote lies. One has to be honest, if I lived in the constituency of David Amos, I wouldn't have voted for him. But that doesn't stop me having proper respect for the man 
and the service he rendered as Member of Parliament for that said constituency. Just as where I live now, my local Member of Parliament did not gain my vote at the last election. He will not gain my vote at the next election. But nevertheless, one acknowledges the service he renders for the people he serves. And those who serve us in such capacity deserve to be safe and secure in their service. They should not be subject to risk of violence, such extreme violence as has been witnessed in these last few days. We often talk of them having a duty to us as public servants. We have a duty to them to see to it that they are able to serve to the best of their ability without fear or favour. And so, whilst we are a world away and many generations away from when Paul wrote that chapter in the letter to the Romans, and whilst we find it hard to hear in many respects, we sense the underlying truth that for the kingdom of God to flourish, we need to do our bit to ensure an orderly and stable society. Not afraid to call out those who govern us if what they choose to do seems to be at odds with the flourishing of that same kingdom. But at the same time, acknowledging that our first responsibility is the stability of our society within which God's will and purpose is done. We commend our dear brother and friend, brother in Christ, who died so violently in this last day. We commend to God his family, his closest supporters, all who will be mourning him. We remember before God and commend to his safekeeping all who serve in similar office throughout the country, all who hold positions of responsibility, that they would retain the freedom to be the people they were when they offered themselves to serve on our behalf. Let us pray together. <clears throat> we thank you, O oh God, for all those who feel themselves led to offer themselves for service, public service, in the political realm. We thank you for opportunities that we have of exercising our right through the ballot box to determine which of them should be in office, which of them should have the right to rule. Forgive us, O oh God, We find ourselves so often in opposition to those so chosen. It's the way of a democracy. And we are mindful, O oh God, of a mood within society at present which seems to suggest that democracy is not enough. That other ways need be found to impress one's opinions upon the government of the day. There is a degree of impatience and frustration and even anger. We cannot wait for what may well be a period of years before we can exercise our vote again. Loving God within the complexities of such a system grant wisdom and understanding to all concerned grant common sense where necessary 
grant forbearance, grant encouragement and blessing and do reward for faithful service rendered. And we are bound to acknowledge, O oh God, that there are many places in your world where government is exercised through brute force and violence and coercion. Many places in your world where people are denied any rights at all, as far as the political process is concerned. We pray for political prisoners throughout the world, those who find themselves in prison and being tortured just because they disagreed with the government of the day. And we pray for the witness of your church that it would hold fast to the injunction to respect those in authority but at the same time not to be unconditional in their support of them. We thank you for the bravery of your church and its leaders who are prepared to stand out against governments and officials who enact laws and rules contrary to your law of love. To that end, bless us, O God, and encourage us to play our proper part in society as it is. And do this, we pray, for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining me for this short act of worship. We'll be here again at the same time next Sunday. But until then, may God bless us all.